Hey, I want to welcome everybody joining us in San Ramon, San Francisco, Dublin. Hey, we're going to have a great day today, but man, doesn't that look like an awesome event? Okay, quick show of hands if you've never been to Orange Fest. Nice. Okay. So this is your first Orange Fest. Um, hey, so what it is, it's an event we do at the end of October every year, and it's an easy invite to your friends, your neighbors. And what's cool is this year we're moving it from Saturday to Sunday. So you can invite your friends or whoever you want to invite, your coworker. You can invite people to join you for service at the second service, and then you can just come uh, hang out afterwards for Orange Fest. And so it's a big family festival event. We've got all these like pumpkin games competitions, lots of candy, and it's a blast. So we look forward to it every year. Let us know you're coming. Just sign up online. And uh, yeah, so then also, um, before we jump into our new teaching series, I want to share uh, an update with you guys. So a few weeks ago, I mentioned that Pastor Marcy is pregnant, my wife. And uh, this is like, if you don't know, we have four girls, and this is our, our fifth and final. Uh, I'm going to do something about that this time. And so we've been like, man, you know, like we can't wait to, you know, I mean, I just kind of figure we're going to have another girl. And so um, this last week or two weeks ago now, actually, Pastor Marcy is like, hey, when you get back from lunch, like I got an email from the, the hospital. Let's let's read it together. And I'm like, OK. And so she's going through and it's like just a bunch of tests and stuff. And I'm, you know, the suspense is building and I'm like, what? OK, like, what is it? You know, and uh, we're having a boy. Yeah. So the girls are like, what does this mean? Like, what's it, what, having a, a boy, like a brother. And I said, he's probably just going to like pee on all your stuff and be really gross and we'll, we'll figure it out together. So it's, uh, yeah, we're excited. Thanks for your prayers though. Um, prayers for just Pastor Marcy and how healthy pregnancy and we really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, but hey, today we are starting a new teaching series called Healthy relationships. And, uh, you know, each week we're going to look at a different essential that's found in every healthy relationship. These are essentials we see in scripture, uh, but really any relationship that you admire and you go, wow, like I want a relationship like that, whether it's a, they're a great friend, they're such a great leader or boss or a great, uh, you know, uh, marriage or whatever, a grandparent, you know, all these different relationships, right? Every single one of them, I guarantee you, if it's a great relationship, if it's a healthy relationship, you'll find that they're actively working at and majoring in one of these essentials. And so, or in, excuse me, in all of these essentials. And so today, what we're looking at is communication. Communic Every great relationship works at communication. Um, so before we read our passage, uh, as I was preparing, as I was praying for our time together and, and for this series, these next, you know, four more weeks, I was really praying for you. And one of the things that I hear sometimes that's really one of the greatest honors to hear is when people say, wow, that message was just for me. That really spoke to me. It's like God was speaking directly to me. And when I hear that, I know that it really comes down, usually comes down to one of two things, either you're going through something and this really speaks to your need right now, or the Holy Spirit is working in your heart. The Holy, the Spirit of God is allowing you to see something you need to see, to hear something, maybe even a conviction, a feeling of like, wow, this needs to change, or I'm going to do something about this. And that is such a beautiful thing. And, you know, in this series, we, we, we really resonate, right? When we hear things that are useful or that, are, that we need in our lives or we know are going to help us. And the thing about this series is we all need to grow in these areas. Like this is going to, every single one of us has relationships. If you're alive on this planet, there are relationships. There's people that you're relating to. And so my prayer has been that God would allow the walls to come down of our heart, the walls in our mind, the things that would cause us to resist what it is that maybe he wants to show us so that we can grow. So let's pray for that together before we get started. Would you bow your heads and join me? Let's pray. God, I pray right now for every person that is here to receive from you today that's here to receive during this, this teaching time, God. I pray that, uh, that there would be no sense of judgment or condemnation, but just an openness to receive the things that you want to show us so that we can be the best we can be in our relationships because when relationships are going well, life is going well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
So our passage today is Ephesians 4.29. We're going to start by reading this. And if you didn't get notes, uh, raise your hand. Or if you need a pen, raise your hand. But you can pull out your notes. There also, you can access the digital notes on the seat if you just tap the seat in front of you. Uh, But let's read our passage together, Ephesians 4.29. It says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Have you ever been uh, boarding a flight and maybe you're walking onto the plane and the cockpit's open and you can hear, kind of hear the pilots talking, maybe they got their headset on and it's like, are they, they're, maybe they're talking to air traffic control or they're talking to another pilot and it sounds like they're speaking another language, <laughs> right? Like, what are they talking about? Well, check this out. Aviation English is the internationally established language of the skies. In 1951, the International Civil Aviation Organization recommended that English be accepted as the lingua franca of the sky. And so within a few years, it actually became a requirement that all pilots had to test on this language, even if they're native English speaking. They had to test on this language, pass a test, because it was that important. This started in the 50s for people's safety. So some of the deadliest accidents in aviation history have been caused by language barriers and miscommunication. In 1977, two Boeing 747 passenger jets collided on a runway on a Spanish island, killing 583 people, largely because they didn't have standardized language. Then in 1966, Saudi Arabian Airlines Flight 763 and Kazakhstan Airlines Flight 1907, they collided in midair. 394 people aboard both planes were killed. This accident was largely attributed to communication. So aviation English was created uh, as a dialect that when used correctly, it completely uh, frees us of ambiguities to help avoid these kinds of tragedies. As his followers, Jesus calls all of us, all of you in this room who are followers of Jesus, he calls us to learn a new language. And this is the language of grace. And this is to eliminate all speech from our lips that might bring us down or bring others down around us. Communication is an essential worth majoring in, not just to have healthy relationships, but because Jesus said it was a big deal and we follow Jesus. And so when we communicate poorly, it can do serious damage. Uh, like, Like two airplanes crashing, it's not just the pilots that get hurt. It affects a whole bunch of other people. When people hurt people with their words, whether it's on purpose or on accident, entire families, communities, even nations can be affected. And so one of the problems is that most of us think that we're pretty good at communicating. Okay, uh, William Ickes, a leading scholar on studying how people, uh, how accurate people are at perceiving what other people are thinking, he did some research on this and here's what he found. Two strangers, when they meet and they're talking for the first time, their accuracy of interpreting one another is usually about 20% when it comes to their communication. And then if a couple friends, if you become friends with someone and you've known them for a while and and a couple friends are communicating, usually it goes up on average to about 35%. So that means that most of us aren't as great as we think we are at communicating but we think that we are. So you can see where there's all kinds of miscommunications that happen in our relationships. And then he also found that if you're married, the likelihood of having accurate communication and perception of one another actually goes down the longer you're together. That is concerning. But it's also believable when you look at the the, the statistics and the rate of divorce, right? So good communication is about understanding people and being understood. Uh, As soon as we start to assume that we know what someone else is thinking, communication starts to break down. Um, So today we're looking at these instructions that are found in our passage. And we're we're just going to read this one more time. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. The apostle Paul 
he really cared about unity. Okay, he's talking to the church in Ephesus all about how to stay unified. And a lot of that had to do with the way they talked to one another. Unity is a powerful concept. If you've ever been on a team at work that felt unified, right? There was probably a lot of trust, a lot of just grace for mistakes, maybe even a positive assumption if, if there is a miscommunication or it does seem like maybe, maybe I don't know something or I'm missing something. You just kind of fill in the gaps with the positive outcomes. You're assuming the best about each other. That's where there's a lot of trust. But on the other hand, you can probably think of a time when you were on a team, whether it's at work, whether it's a sports team, whether it's any kind of team, maybe even in your family where there wasn't a lot of trust, there wasn't very good communication. And how does that feel? It feels stressful. It feels draining. It feels really hard to get things done because trust determines the pace for which a team is able to get things done. And so Jesus wants us to be people who bless each other, who add value to each other, who we can trust, who have each other's back. Now, all throughout the Bible, wherever we saw great unity, God did great things. One of the things we talk about here at Brave is like our prayer and our hope as followers of Jesus in the Bay Area, where we are a spiritual minority, is that God would use us, that we get to be a part of a movement that helps change the spiritual climate of the Bay Area. You know what it's gonna take for that to happen? It starts with our relationships. It starts with us. It starts with the level of our unity. That little offense, that little hurt, that little frustration that you might just think maybe that's not a big deal. Okay, maybe it's with the person that you're sitting next to. Don't look left. Don't look right. Like, let's be real. Some of you got in, in a fight on the way here today. And I know that because I've had that happen, okay? So we're, we've got these issues with each other, but sometimes we don't realize. That wasn't today, by the way. Some of, we, actually I did, I got in a fight with my toddler. So there you go. We don't realize how significant this is when it comes to the things that God wants to do. Because the level of unity and the level of health in our relationships has a direct impact. When the people of God are unified, when the church is unified, it is unstoppable. This is why the apostle Paul talked about it so much. So as we move into these next few weeks, I want you to be thinking about the level of unity in your relationships. How healthy are they in your family, with your friendships, maybe in your, in your brave group or in your marriage with your parents. And if the level of unity is trending downwards, not up, or it could be better, it's almost always because there's an issue in communication. So that's where we're going to start today in week one. And this is the first thing that we learn. Number one in your notes, your words reveal what's in your heart. Your words reveal what's in your heart. Proverbs says, from the heart, the mouth speaks. So what's in your heart is going to come out. Whether the words you choose are encouraging and uplifting and kind and, and caring or, or unwholesome, critical, mean-spirited, or impatient. Words are indicators of what's inside the heart. Uh, our mouth actually acts as a thermometer for the condition of our heart. If you want to know what's going on in my heart, how's my heart doing? If you want to check the temperature of your heart, listen to some of the things you're saying. Listen to yourself talk, evaluate your words. What kinds of things are coming out? Are they selfish or are they generous? Are they, are they pushy or are they patient? Are they reliant on God, reliant on others in a healthy way? Or are they self-reliant? If it's all about I, me, or mine, or uh, instead of we, ours, and theirs, something's going on, right? Uh, for example, in leadership, you can often tell how much of your leadership is about yourself by how often you use possessive pronouns, okay? The more it's about me, myself, and I, the smaller and less involved and empowered everyone around me feels, which is why I don't use phrases like my team, my staff, my event, right? Or I, th I built this, this is my vision, right? No, it's ours. We're a part of something here. I heard a story recently uh, illustrates this so well. Uh, there was this frog and these two geese and they were talking. So this is a pretend story. And they were talking and the frog says, can you guys give me a ride down south? I want to fly with you south for the winter. And the geese were thinking about it. And they're like, well, I don't know how we're going to do that. And he says, I got an idea. If you take this stick and you, you both put your mouths on both sides of it, 
I'll hold on in the middle and you can carry me as you fly. And so they're flying down and another bird flies up and says, wow, this is incredible. What a great idea. Whose idea was this? The frog goes, my idea, as he falls to the ground, right? If your leadership is about you, if it's my idea, my stuff, my vision, my team, it'll never live beyond you. See, we all have a choice. We have to either lead others towards God or towards ourselves, okay? Proverbs says, let another praise you, not your own lips. The words that you use speak of the motives of your heart. And so you can't be merciful and judgmental at the same time. You can't be greedy and generous at the same time. You can't be jealous and happy for others at the same time. And now here's the thing though. We have all been judgmental. We've all been jealous. We've all been greedy. We don't often say it, but we know it's there. So what do we do when we hear ourselves start to say things that tell us, oh, maybe I'm, I'm struggling on the inside. What do we do? We need to take action. King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. This is what he said in Proverbs 4, 23. He said, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. There's a story about a small village in the Alps and they were going through a hard time economically. There was a downturn. And so they got together. They had a town hall meeting to look at the budget. Like, what can we cut? We've got to make some cuts. And they noticed a line that was to go to a guy that was referred to as the keeper of the spring. And nobody really knew this guy. They knew there was, they heard there was an old man who lives up at the top above their village and that he just cleans debris out from the water and the keeper of the spring. And so they thought, well, you know, this is probably just a benevolence thing. We should just, you know, we're gonna have to cut this, right? So they sent a boy to run up and let him know. And so he decided to move back into town and live with his niece. Well, not long after this, there, you know, first everything was okay, but then not too long after this, there, people started getting really sick. Some people even died and they realized, oh, what he was doing was really important. It was keeping our water clean. It was keeping us healthy. So quickly they reinstated him. He went back up and started removing the debris and cleaning out their, their, the, the stream where their water came from, the spring where their water came. And the next thing you know, health started returning back to the village. The moral of this story is that you are the keeper of your spring, the spring that is your heart. You're responsible for the words that flow from your heart out of your mouth. Okay, which brings us to point number two, to change your relationships, take control of your words. If there's a relationship in your life that you're like, I know this could be better. It always starts with taking responsibility. How am I using my words? What can I take control of? In the stream of your thoughts, you have the power to decide. You have the power to filter certain thoughts out or to entertain them. If you start entertaining self-defeating thoughts, if you let that debris get in there, you're gonna get depressed. You're gonna get discouraged. Uh, if you start entertaining dishonoring thoughts towards your friends or your coworkers or your spouse, eventually you're gonna say things that undermine them in your relationship. They will, not, they will move in and occupy your mind and they will crowd out the presence of God in your life. So how do you stop your heart from being corrupted? Well, the first thing that this verse says is do not let. In other words, we're responsible for what we say. We have the power to control our tongue. We choose the words we speak. You know, a lot of people... We make excuses when we misspeak, when we say things like, oh, I don't didn't, I didn't really mean that, or it's just how I am, it's just my personality, it's just my culture. But as followers of Jesus, we're committed and commanded to use our words differently. We, we can't entertain these kinds of excuses. The word used for unwholesome, sapros, it literally means bad, rotten, and decayed. Okay, if you're hungry, Say it's, say it's like you wake up and you're like, oh man, it's like the middle of the night. You're like, oh, I'm just so hungry. I need a snack. You go into your fridge. You're looking in your fridge, trying to find something and you see some strawberries, but they're rotten. You don't go, well, I'm really hungry. So I'm just going to eat them. No, you don't eat rotten fruit, right? Nobody does that. But when you say unwholesome things, it's as if something rotten 
is coming out of your mouth. Paul's saying to followers of Jesus, you gotta choose your words carefully. You've gotta consider the effect. The health of our relationships can often be measured by the level of responsibility we're willing to take for our words. We've gotta take the weight of our words seriously. When I first stepped into the role of lead pastor here at Brave, uh, one of my mentors said something to me and I didn't really understand it at first. He said, Samuel, your whisper becomes a shout. And I'm like, what, what does that mean? And what he was speaking to is, hey, what you say, even if it's a whisper, carries a lot of weight. You know, that's true in marriage. That's true in parenting. It doesn't matter if you're leading, someone, if you're leading anything at work, if you're a captain on a sports team, like any sphere of influence that you have been given, your words, whether it's a whisper or a shout, has an impact. The things that we say about our children in front of our children, the things that we say about other people in front of our children, you can either illuminate or diminish. You're either adding, adding to their perception of someone or taking away. So what is unwholesome speech? It's usually what comes out when we're frustrated or we're upset about something. It's usually what comes out uh, when we just are feeling a lot of emotion on the inside that's not good and it just comes out in these different ways. So it might come out in the form of passive aggression, sarcasm, cursing, bringing up the past in a guilting kind of accusing way. It might come up, come out yelling or shouting, exaggerating or making generalizations. Ironically, it could also come out in the form of the silent treatment, just creating you know, some unhealthy space, punishing someone in your silence. Now, now, we've all done this. We've all reacted and said things in ways that we regret. So if you're stuck or you're in a pattern of this right now, I just want to encourage you, you can take control. You can take control of your words. You can break these patterns that aren't working in your relationships. I mean, you might need to start by understanding where they started. Psychologist David Brooks in his recent book, How to Know a Person, uh, I highly recommend this book. I read it this summer, just in preparation, thinking about this series that we'd be in. And, and in his book, he explains how childhood has such a huge impact on the effect of who we are as adults. And what's inside of our hearts begins accumulating in childhood, both positive and negative. It affects our hearts. It even affects our personality. When children go through negative things or hurtful or harmful things, we construct defenses to protect ourselves. We draw lessons from these experiences to protect ourselves and survive. For example, um, here's just a few negative ways that we try to protect ourselves that usually creates unhealth in our relationships. Avoidance. Oh, emotions and relationships have hurt me, so I'm, I'm gonna minimize emotions and relationships in my life. Uh, deprivation is this mindset that my needs aren't gonna get met, I'm not worthy, so you just become kind of hopeless. Overreactivity, this is being trapped in hyperactive mind theater. It's uh, where the world is dangerous and you overreact to things and you fail to see them clearly and you're not really sure why, but you just keep reacting. Or passive aggression. Passive aggression is the indirect expression of anger. So at some point in our lives, most of us come to the realization that some of the ways that we're relating to people or the ways we're thinking or speaking and using our words just isn't really working for us. It's not taking us where we want to be in our relationships. And so in theory, when we realize this, we'd be able to fix it if you think about it or process you know, through introspection. But what research has found is that introspection is overrated. Because the more time you spend alone thinking about it doesn't mean that you're getting anywhere good because you're too close to yourself. You can only see yourself so well. The path forward is through communication. And for followers of Jesus, that starts in communication with God. The person who created you, that knows you better than you know yourself, that knows everything you've been through, that can guide you and lead you in the perfect path, when you start communicating more with God about the things in your heart or the things you identify that just the ways you don't want to be anymore, everything gets better because you're talking to the right person. So this week, I want to give you some homework. And if you're struggling with something, if you're frustrated in a relationship, if you're working through some pain, whatever that might be, if it were that frustration, that anger, whatever that negative thing that is just producing within you, the moment you catch yourself, you're like, oh man, I was, 
a little sarcastic there. I was a little unnecessarily mean or rude or critical, or I, I started building a case against that person. The moment you start to sense that or notice that, give yourself a time out, take some time and pray through these questions. Okay, these questions are in your notes. I, there's something you can come back to anytime you're frustrated. Three questions. First, what specifically is bothering me? God, help me see it. Because often the thing on the surface that we think is bothering us is connected to something so much more. And if we don't get to the specific thing, the deeper thing, we can't break the pattern. People don't usually recognize greed and jealousy and anger and you know, all comparison and all these things that we actually struggle with. We usually recognize it as a frustration or a problem or whatever, whatever we say, but listen, God will show you. And the sooner you allow God to show you the deeper thing, Man, that's going to lead to such good things in your relationships. Next, what do I want the other person to do or not do? What am I really after? Like, have I, have I made my expectations clear? Have I created the appropriate boundaries I need maybe in these relationships? Next week, we're talking about boundaries. That's the next element that we're going to cover is boundaries that can produce health, that can produce clarity in the relationships in our lives that matter most. And then lastly, are my feelings in proportion to the issue? Are my feelings in proportion to the issue? Um, there's nothing like a toddler to demonstrate overreaction. Do you guys know any toddlers? Okay, we thought it would be cool after we found out the news that we're having a boy to share with the kids when we were picking them up. And so we were picking up Elia, our three-year-old, and we did not get the reaction we were expecting. She started yelling and threw herself on the floor I'm like, this is not what I was expecting. Then, then she goes, no, we only do girls in this family. We don't do boys. In the hallway of the preschool. She's doing a lot better now, but sometimes when we're frustrated about things, we act like toddlers. Have you guys ever met an adult that was acting like a toddler? Okay. We don't grow out of that sometimes, okay? So we lose control of our emotions. We all do. This is when we just need to give ourselves a time out. We need to take some time. This is when you don't send that text. This is when you don't reply to that email. This is when you don't, you know, whatever you need to do, you need to pray. You need to take some time. You need to go to sleep. And you may find the next day or after some time has passed that you were just overreacting. Number three, grace is the language that builds people up. Grace is the language. And maybe you've heard this quote, it's not what you said, it's what they heard that counts. Which means I'm responsible for at least 65% when other people misunderstand me. That's, that's, that's actually hard when you think about it, right? To take that kind of responsibility. So after we've identified the stuff that we're saying that isn't good, after we've taken responsibility, we've braved the depths of our hearts. We've said, look, I want to face this stuff. I want to know what's really going on. After all of this, let's play offense. Like, what does great communication look like? What is commun this communication that, that the apostle Paul is talking about that builds people up? That's what we want to get to. According to Paul, it's when we communicate with this language of grace. Like learning any new language, it's not easy especially when uh, we see someone else as wrong or incorrect, right? Especially when they, they're, 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 you know, not presenting the facts correctly or accurately. And some of us, we're just wired for truth telling. My oldest daughter is this way. Uh, we'll be riding in the car and her sisters will say something and she'll be like, that's not true. That's not correct. And they'll say like, it'll be sunny out. We'll be driving home from school. It's, it's like 80 degrees and they'll be like, it's raining. And she'll be like, no, it's not. And they get a kick out of it. They think it's hilarious. And then, and then they'll start singing, it's raining, it's pouring. And she's getting more and more mad. And I'm like, hey, it's okay. Just don't listen to them. Guys, stop it. But what about when we're taking time to get to know someone, when we're trying to connect with them, when we want them to feel seen? Did you know not everyone needs to be fact-checked on everything? right? People tell me stuff all the time. I'm like, that's not true. I don't always have to say something. I used to think I did. Sometimes it just doesn't matter. 
What does this have to do with grace? One dimension of grace is simply knowing the difference between what really needs to be said and what can be overlooked. Not everything is worth correcting. Again, let's play offense. Let's focus. Yeah, we want to stop the stuff that shouldn't be coming out, but we also want to say the stuff that should, the God stuff, the stuff that's going to really make a difference in our relationships, that's going to create health, that, where we're going to thrive, saying good things about people, even when they're not around. Like nobody likes to hear that somebody was saying something about you and that wasn't true or wasn't good or wasn't honoring or wasn't nice or, man, did you, did you hear that? But doesn't it feel so good when someone says, yeah, I had coffee with so-and-so or we had dinner. Man, they really like you. Like they were, they, were, they were saying this about you and it was so cool. They were really like building you up and it was so refreshing. We love it. We love it when that happens. Let's be that kind of person for other people. Like there's going to be thoughts and things that come in your mind that are from God that other people need to hear. See, God created us to need more than just him. He created us to need each other. And that means there's things that you need to say that are going to affirm people and uplift them that they need to hear from you. That's an incredible responsibility. When a thought comes into your mind that's positive, that's encouraging, don't just keep it for yourself. Say it, say it out loud. Send, send that text, send that message. Say that in the meeting. See, the battle within all of us is how we're gonna use our influence. Will we be illuminators that shine our light the way Jesus intended? Or will we be diminishers? Diminishers make people feel small. They make people feel unseen. They see other people as things to be used, not people to be befriended. They stereotype, they ignore. They're so focused on themselves that other people just aren't on their radar. But illuminators, they're different. They're curious about people. They want to get to know people. They want to see if there's a part they can play in someone else's life, a part that they can play that might help them, that might unlock something, that might meet a need. They know what to look for and how to ask the right questions. They've trained themselves and they've worked at being someone who can understand others. There's a story about Winston Churchill's mother, and she talks about how she had dinner once with a statesman. And after the dinner, she said that she just had dinner with the most clever person in all of England. Then she had dinner with his rival. And she said after that dinner that he made her feel like the most clever person in all of England. And she said, it's better to be like the rival, the person that illuminated her, that caused her to light up, that added value in her life. See, many of us, we find it easy to help someone out when they need a favor, when they need something like, hey, can you give me a ride? Hey, can you help me move? Can, can I borrow this? Can, I, um, can you do the dishes or can you help watch my kids? You know, these practical things. But sometimes what people need from us that's just as practical, just as important, if not more important, is grace. Grace when we're angry, grace when we make a mistake, grace when we're hurting, grace when we're just stressed and overwhelmed, grace when we're immature. The best favor we can do for others is treat them the same way that Jesus treated us despite the condition of our heart. There's an old parable about two seas in Israel, the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. The Dead Sea is 10 times saltier than the ocean. Nothing lives within it. No, no animals can survive. In the Sea of Galilee, it's flourishing with marine life. It's beautiful. And what these seas have in common is they're both fed by the Jordan River. The Dead Sea is at the lowest point on the planet. It receives from the Jordan River, but it cannot give back. It can only receive. The Sea of Galilee receives from the Jordan River, but it's also able to give back. For followers of Jesus, as we receive God's grace, if we don't let it flow back to others, we cease to produce life. Imagine what would happen this week if we decided we're not just going to receive, 
but we're going we're gonna to overflow. We're going to look for opportunities to give the kind of grace that God has given us to other people. If we decided to let the grace we've received come out by the words that we speak, Ephesians 4.29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Let's make that our prayer this week. Would you pray with me? God, I pray right now for everyone who is listening to this. God, I, I, I trust and I know that you have been speaking. And so God, I pray that you would show us opportunities to encourage and affirm and to bring more positivity, to illuminate, to bring your light and shine it on others. God, I pray if there are people listening right now, maybe they even have a gift of encouragement and it's gone dormant because so much has been happening in their life that's taken their focus. And, and for good reason, maybe hard things, maybe stressful things, challenging things. And maybe they just feel like I just need to receive, but you actually want to break through in a way that connects them back to their purpose, that the life that they're trying to get is gonna come as they give back as they let that grace flow through them again. God, I pray for a breakthrough for those that are gifted to encourage. I pray for all of us, but especially those. In Jesus' name, amen.